Hi everybody, meteorologist Joe Chaffee. Welcome to the Joe Chaffee Weather Show on the 9th of October, 2019. 7.30 uh, p.m. Eastern Time start. Uh, I wanted to give it a later start as the uh, Yom Kippur Holy Day comes to an end, so that will give uh, our uh, Jewish viewers uh, plenty uh, some time to jump on the live stream now that we are past sunset. And uh, we just want to extend our best that you had a uh, wonderful uh, stretch during these uh, th during the Jewish holidays this year, and uh, let us now look ahead to uh, our weather, which is very busy again today. We've got uh, two storms uh, producing uh, major headaches. One in the east, of course, uh, this uh, uh, little nor'easter that apparently could. And uh, also, we have the second snowstorm of the season in the northern Rockies that is going to move into the northern plains and be their first snowstorm of the season. And uh, when we look at that, we're also going to, I want to look back. There's something about this particular date uh, with regards to um, snowstorms, uh, or, or just snow in particular, in, 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 in the instance of um, uh, the one that goes back in the past. And uh, thanks to Scott Briller for finding <clears throat> uh, some data on it for me. The chairman is back tonight, uh, so all is right with the world. Uh, but uh, you're going to find a little oddity about the Rocky storm uh, that we're going to point out. But uh, indeed, uh, it is <clears throat> a uh, very, very busy night tonight from the standpoint of watches and warnings. And by the way, Joe Rayo will be joining me shortly in that he loves to make an entrance. So uh, we're going to let him. Uh, so here's your uh, map tonight and uh, loaded with winter storm warnings up through Montana, virtually all of North Dakota under a winter storm warning, and uh, the, at least the western half of South Dakota, much of Wyoming except the southwestern third, and a small portion of northwestern uh, Nebraska. So a busy winter storm there and then various winter weather advisories that are up uh, down into parts of Colorado. You've got freeze wa uh, wa uh, warnings uh, up uh, for parts of Kansas and in into the rest of Nebraska. For frost advisories down into Texas. So this deep trough in the west is really having serious impact. It's also having impact uh, in the along the west coast in two ways. One is <coughs> you'll notice, <coughs> excuse me, down the coast uh, of Washington, Oregon, and Northern California we have uh, freeze warnings up there, but uh, also a lot of red flag warnings up through California, and uh, it's a big story with the wind that is going to be generated uh, in California. The power company is taking down power to almost a million people in order to kind of a preemptive way of preventing uh, a spark uh, that caused uh, the big wildfires back a couple of years ago, and uh, you know knocking down a uh, strong winds knocking down power lines, sparks fly, and uh, you wind up you wound up with a, with a, with a uh, a huge wildfire. And in response to that, uh, they're just not going to take any chances. Uh, but you know, you take a million people out of off the power grid, that's a lot, uh, and it's going to have some impact. So uh, we're seeing we're seeing weather playing a role here in a number of different ways. And of course, the purple that you see off the New Jersey coast and off the Long Island coast and off the coast of southeastern uh, of New England, storm warnings up for the coastal waters there as our uh, low that is impacting the northeast is uh, beginning to rev up and it's getting ready to do a counterclockwise loop and just as I talk about counterclockwise loops, who walks in the door but the loopy. The no, loopy never, never loopy. Hold on. <laughs> Let's get you a full screen here. Otherwise, they can only see a shred of your hair. Well, you know, if you move the camera... You mean not, not center it completely on me? Move it. There, there he is. There he is. Now, come forward. Oh, you always yes. lean. All right. Uh, come, come forward. So there we are. Talking about the uh, the nor'easter, I presume. Well, we're talking about that, Joe. Uh, talking about the the uh, the storm, the big storm in the, in the uh, in the nor in the northern Rockies, the second snowstorm in in less than ten days, and we're not talking about something that produces a couple of inches. Right. Uh, this is another one that's going to produce uh, a couple of feet in some places, particularly in the Dakotas, in parts of the Dakotas. Well, it's nice to see the progression because <clears throat> the last one was Montana. 
Now it's the Dakotas. Right. And so it's also now, Montana again and Wyoming. And so they'll keep progressing eastward, so the next one on the list will be Minnesota. Minnesota and the Iowa, Western Lakes, you if know, you want to use right. that logic. Also, uh, we just finished talking about the fact that this was kind of um, something that you, didn't really, you don't really think about as, as, as a consequence, but the, the big storm in the West is creating uh, strong wind conditions in California, and they are shutting down the power preemptively to almost a million people. Right around Sacramento. And, yes. And... Uh, a million people without having to go without power, and they haven't even told them when this will, you know, be well, taken down or whatever. Th this is as a result, I believe, from the wildfires back in, in six November, six, November six, of last year, I think. No, I think this is one before that because uh, P, uh, PG and E, I believe it's PG and E, the power company, had to file for bankruptcy uh, because of the lawsuits, and they're still working all of that out. Uh, but uh, because it was apparently a spark from a down power line, right, right. and they're basically saying, "Look, we're going to take this preemptive strike here by taking the power down because uh, we don't want to risk another power line going down and starting another ma massive fire." But what do you do without power? There's a million people oh. there. I was on coming in on the uh, coming into work here. I was listening on the radio. Uh, there was a woman says. I, I, I work from home. My computer, every day. How can I work now? And well, what do hospitals do? What are people that have, uh, have well, equipment? Yeah, uh, you have you generators. Know, gener well, or if you have equipment that uh, is life-sustaining right. for, for folks. Now, I have a generator at my house, and I can indeed you know turn on the lights and run the oven and whatever, but the generator will not help if I want to go online. The, I, I cannot, you know, if I... At my computer at home, my home computer, the Wi-Fi is down. I mean, I'll have to, I have to use my little phone to, <coughs> to communicate with the world. Well, you know, you can outside. use your phone as a hotspot. Really? Yes. I did not know. Oh that. yes, you could use your phone as a hotspot. I, I I do that sometimes. I get a better signal sometimes on the hotspot. That's Assu amazing. Assume you have, but make sure you have unlimited data. Okay. You better ask Mrs. Rayo because you don't want to <laughs> surprise her, you know, with with an unintended bill. Yes. Um, all right. So uh, we're going to come. We're going to talk all about this with respect to. Ooh, I, oh, there we go. I just want to make sure I don't. You're getting me dizzy. I'm sorry. I'm just kind of. I'm so excited that you're here and we're having fun. Uh, so I'm going to bring up. Uh, I, I already did the watches and warnings. So let's go to the U.S. satellite loop. I got a lot of graphics up here, Joe. Um, I can see. Yeah, because we got a lot to talk about. So, first I'm of all, spend a couple hours with my daughter and teach her about OBS. If she looked at, I I don't know exactly what this is. <laughs> I have never seen this before. So, oh, it's easy. So it's easy. So here's our U.S. loop tonight, Joe. If, if one thing about the system that in the east, it's definitely not a tropical system. Uh, clearly, no the, warm the, core. Yeah, there's no warm core here. And uh, in the meantime, you can also see. The big trough that's coming into the west with uh, the major storm, the snowstorm there, and all that dry air that is sitting just to our west and not getting here. <laughs> you know, I, I mentioned on the air this evening in the lower Hudson Valley, I mean, th this, this storm has been played up quite a bit. And I keep stressing to all of you who are in the lower Hudson Valley of New York uh, that uh, we're just getting the peripheral or fringe effects. For example, western sections of Orange County didn't see a drop of rain today. All through the day, it just right. it, it it places to the south and to the east <coughs> got the rain. Aren't so you know you talk about this storm and yeah there'll be some gusty. The further inland you go, this is this is not going to be anything really to write home about. But again, in our particular age here, you know they lead off the news. You know big storm or nor'easter. You know and you, it makes it sound like well the, end I, of the world is. I, you know we you and I have talked about this before. One of the things that I I. Uh, I find that I have to do right from the very get-go is I have to gain control of the conversation. You have to you have to do that. You have to gain control of the conversation, and 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 the biggest problem is that you're going to have uh, when you do this <coughs> are the forecast shoppers, right? Because uh, you know now I just as an example, and I talked about this last night. Uh, I <coughs> was um, I saw something from somebody talking about. Uh, a four to six foot storm surge coming in, and and then I look and it's like, where are you? You know, I thought, where are you getting this? <coughs> Excuse me. And it turns out <coughs> they were looking at a tidal chart that showed uh, that the, um, the 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 particular high tide was going to be four feet above mean low water. 
-hmm. or five feet above mean low water or six right. feet above mean low water. But that's not surge. Okay, when you're talking about a surge, you're talking about where your high tide is, and then you're adding another four or five feet or whatever you're adding. So you're, there is no surge, okay? There isn't any. You're not dealing with a storm. This low is staying offshore. You're not dealing with anything that's coming on. But, you know, all this stuff gets out there, you know, and I get messages from people saying that they've been told that this is, you know, this is the reappearance of Sandy all over again, which is something that just boggles my mind. And we went through this um, yesterday. We explained how there are, some, you know, the, there are huge differences in terms of the upper air, the the, the bottom of the atmosphere, the, the tropical versus non-tropical. Uh, I know everybody's still jittery, even though it, it, it's been seven years, but uh, that's it's a generational event. It's going to be something that's in the mind of a lot of people for many years to come until such time as either they are no longer with us or you get... You know, you get another generational storm. I, 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 the two things I don't understand about this. Number one, um, w higher than normal tides. We we are not at that astronomical high tide. We are actually midway between uh, first quarter and full moon. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that as as the astronomers say the syzygy effect. We right. have the three and the full moon is Sunday. Line. Full moon is this coming uh, weekend. Yeah. So we're not quite there yet. But number two, the winds are out of the north and northeast, and I wonder about this talk about coastal flooding. Right. I mean, how is it possible if you're going to have a north-northeast wind? If you live along the south shore of Long Island, and the wind is coming in from the north, I could understand that this was a southeaster or southerly wind <coughs> pushing that water on shore. But this actually is going to be a very gusty north. Well, when, when when the when that low does that counterclockwise loop and goes back westward overnight and into tomorrow more, tomorrow, which it's going to do. It may bend that wind around the south shore of Long Island, especially out towards Suffolk County, more easterly for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, we've hit the bottom of the of the low tide cycle, so the tides are rising with each one. I, I, I think it's I think it's probably a combination of <clears throat> the um, uh, the fact that you maybe you you don't have the most favorable wind for a, a, a coastal flooding event, but um, compensating for that is that you're dealing with this thing sitting out there over about three or four high tide cycles, so less water gets out. So you, right. but uh, I tonight's high tide, for example, producing minor coastal flooding, and only in the most vulnerable of locations. And this is quoting the Weather Service, and they are forecasting moderate coastal flooding for the high tides for later to, not tomorrow, the, tomorrow, not the first one, but the one tomorrow evening. Right. Which I think kind of makes sense when you look at the scheme of things, because that'll be the third high tide, and I would think that the water would be somewhat high. But um, how about for places along the North Shore? Well, that would be a different thing now because of the wind. You know, the wind's going to be. If the wind is northeast or north, that kind of favors the water piling down on the north shore of Long Island and not on Connecticut or Westchester. Right. If it's an east-northeast wind where it goes all the way down the sound, then you pile the water back into Nassau on Nassau uh, and uh, also the Westchester County shore the, uh, and the Connecticut shore. That's what we saw so, during the great nor'easter of December 92, if you remember. Right. right. That was like the, just literally like the, the water just didn't have any place to go. And it, and it just kept, kept piling and piling yeah, and right, piling. Right. So yeah, this is a bit different. They're all a little bit different. Uh, and of course, every uh, uh, a number of people were taken aback by the European model run two days ago with the you know the 50 foot waves crashing onto the Jersey Shore, onto the Long Island coastline, and the 70 mile an hour sustained winds. Um, no, it didn't. They're not happening. Okay, <laughs> not happening. You can't take one singular run. I mean, they're. They're always what I used to refer to back in the day, Joe, uh, a burp, so yeah. to speak. Uh, a little bit of indigestion. WPC uh, has been really pretty good with their rainfall here. And one of the things I want to just point out, now on Long Island today, it was raining pretty much all day. And right. eastern Long Island actually got some heavier rain on the order of about, uh, about a half to three quarters of an inch so far. But uh, uh, you know, WPC is forecasting three inch plus rains from central Long Island eastward in total out of this, and that makes sense. And yet you go, the bl the blue, the dark blue is the half inch line. That's at New York City, so uh, you can see how it cuts off very, very sharp. sharply. Mm -hmm. And this is a win This is a storm in the winter, if it were snow, where uh, I would be, you know, I'd be buried and. Uh, 
go just west of New York City, and, and you know, you, maybe by you, you'd, you'd have your broom out. We'd have a few few inches, maybe. Maybe, maybe. But it, this would have been, would be an interesting uh, snow coastal event. Meanwhile, by the way, take a look up in North Dakota. You've got uh, two plus inches of two three inches of liquid being generated there. And much of that is going to be in the form of a heavy wet snow, which uh, I've got the forecast up for that. But we're going to do that. We're going to finish up with our storm first, and then we're going to go to that plains storm, which is uh, that's a good thing that they they finally ended the baseball season a couple of days ago in Minnesota, and I can't believe that you know the originally not originally they they used to play. Uh, at Metropolitan <coughs> Stadium in Minnesota baseball. Right, when they were outdoors. And, then, and that was outdoors, but then they built what was called the Hubert H. Humphrey Dome. And uh, that was basically nothing. It really wasn't a dome like the Astrodome. It was like more like a balloon. And uh, the balloon deflated, I think, on more than one occasion. And then they finally just threw up their arms and they said, let's build a new stadium, but the new stadium doesn't have any kind of covering at all. So uh, what I'm saying is, is that it's a good thing in a way that the baseball season is over in Minnesota because had they continued, I'm sure that they would be running into those colder nights bitter, bitter frigidly yeah. cold nights and maybe even some snow out up there so good. They're uh, and here's, here's our radar by the way, you can see uh, something you don't see too often uh, up in this area, uh, but uh, every once in a while it does happen where you see all the rain backing in from the east Right. and uh, we had a couple each one of those bands by the way really kind of marks how this is working you're getting these surges of rain that come back in from the east. There's a band, a dying band in western New Jersey that's, that's kind of shrinking away. Now you have, have this new band that has moved into eastern Long Island and advancing its way westward into Suffolk. And then there's another break. And then there's a third band that is southeast of Cape Cod. And that one comes in Thursday morning. That one, will be when it gets here, will be accompanied by 40 to 50 mile an hour winds over, over eastern Long Island and in southeastern New England, uh, out in the Cape, um, Hyannis, Nantucket, uh, they're going to get hit pretty hard with, um, with storm force winds uh, out of this. And uh, there's some pretty decent rain even back up through Massachusetts and reaching up into southern New Hampshire and just barely but not quite touching that southern little corner of Maine. Uh, so uh, you don't see it too often. So there's not... Uh, it, it oftentimes, Joe, when you get these upper lows like this, uh, I've noticed over the years that a lot of times the rain winds up getting further west than you think. Yeah. And then there's this sharp wall where you go from rain and you know gloomy, overcast conditions, and then all of a sudden it's like mostly clear. And in, in regard to that, I think that trying to time out at best the chronology of the next 24 to 48 hours based upon. Uh, several computer models. Tonight I think we're, we're going to see in the immediate tri-state area now just some lingering spotty light rain or maybe some uh, spotty drizzle. And tomorrow, Joe, and I mentioned this to you the, when I came in here, I wouldn't be surprised if for a while tomorrow in the morning we actually got some sunshine. Uh, I saw some sun... Uh, we, well, for you some, certainly it's not impossible. Sunshine or at least some dry weather or brightening of the skies and then as you just pointed out, the next surge will be coming in from the east, moving across Suffolk County and Nassau County, probably reaching the immediate tri-state area by midday or early afternoon. We'll go through a round of rain and wind with that, then some leftover spotty precipitation tomorrow night. And then on Friday, I think we're pretty much done with this, not so much in terms of the wind. The wind will still be rather busy, but I think we'll have just a couple of leftover early showers on, on Friday. And then a slow, underscore that word, slow improvement from later Friday and on into the upcoming holiday weekend. Uh, I pulled up the surface map. Uh, you've got two lows here. The northernmost low is the dominant non-tropical low. And the low that is uh, east of North Carolina was that little tropical low that formed yesterday off the coast of South Carolina. But it never really did get going. And it's just basically going to be absorbed by that uh, by the, by the low and, and the lows out pretty far east it's out at about 68 and a half west and it's going to begin its migration back uh, westward and then southwestward as it does this 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 counterclockwise loop which keeps it here for another two to almost three days it, it almost reminds me maybe this you could say is the junior version or a much lesser version of the so-called perfect storm in October of 91 and of course in October 91 we had a confluence of uh, a very uh, dynamic upper level uh, trough 
which actually closed off. We also had Hurricane Grace. Remember? I think that yes. was a, like a minimal storm, a minimal hurricane right. that kind of became involved or was eaten by that by that dynamic upper level system. Well, that upper level low, as I remember, started out like southeast of Newfoundland, yeah, and just moved back southwestward. It southwest. was the most, it was the darndest thing I think I've ever seen. I remember seeing it in the long range and thinking, boy, this looks really weird. In fact, I, I also even remember telling Janet Allshaus about that storm, about that storm days beforehand, saying, you know what, we need to watch. You know, this looks serious here. Um, it's amazing what you remember and what you don't. How come then they didn't make a movie about you and Janet Althouse? Instead, they made a movie about my former boss, Todd Gross, in Boston. He was there. If you saw the movie The Perfect Storm, the, the, the guy, the TV meteorologist who was going crazy right. was my former boss, Todd Gross. And, and of course, they, built, they didn't build the whole story around him, but, just his, but I know that you're just as enthusiastic about these things as Todd was. So you should right. Know. Well, but it was it was a it was a Massachusetts. We base, were in you know. we were in incredibly deep negotiations with, <laughs> with those making the film, and you know, uh, they were being very uh, they were being very difficult. I was being even more difficult. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I told them I couldn't possibly come to work before ten in the morning. I must be done before four thirty at night. <laughs> My own trailer, you know, they, they they just didn't seem to want to go for that. Well, that was that was some storm. They they, they even they, they called it the no name storm because right. they felt. And later on, <laughs> after they did more analysis, they actually said that that was a tropical system, or did they give it a name, or did they? I don't remember. Well, they never. No, maybe in post analysis they might have made it, you know, subtropical or tropical. Yeah, I have to go back and do a little reading up on it. Right. I got the water vapor imagery because I thought this was pretty interesting. I'm looking at the mid levels, Joe, and you talk. You know, when we talk about the uh, sort of strangeness with a system like this, with the upper air low that is sitting up uh, over us, and then you've got the surface low. I could do a little bit of uh, drawing here if uh, my tools will work. Um, hang Oops. on, that was yesterday. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you've got this upper level low here. You've got the surface low is probably somewhere, you know, out here on the edge of this. But all of this, look at this is all mid level dry air right. that has moved up uh, off the coast. It actually has reached up into southern New Jersey. So you and that's know, the reason why. All of that. Say, that's why I say tomorrow, don't be surprised early in the day. If the sun does put on a cameo appearance or breaks through, and you're out there saying, "Well, wait a minute now," the weather people were saying it was going to be rainy and windy. Here's the sun coming out, but that that mid-level dry air could possibly pin, impinge onto our neck of the woods and help to uh, break up the cloud cover a little bit. Well, and there's as we you know also the fact that you the, just the banding nature of all right. of this with, right. in terms of the precip. It's not like some solid wall, and you and you can see the difference between what's going on in the east. And then what's going on in the West, where, hold on, what did, why did it do that? I lost my pencil. Uh, <laughs> uh, but here in the West, I Remember mean... Remember now, it's a number two if yeah, you're taking the test. Uh, right, you've got this, this really deep trough here out in the West. The second one uh, in 10 days that's come into the West, and this is our snowstorm that's going to be happening uh, up in the Northern Plains. But interestingly, unlike the first storm, which, if you recall... They were they were going you know cold and snow out in the plain states, and at the same time we were experiencing extreme heat. Yes. I, that's not going to happen this go. Well, and it's not because of the fact that you have this little cutoff right. uh, that's here in the east. So uh, let, I'm going to bring up uh, we'll bring up the surface map so we can look at both systems. And then I just sort of want to spend some time on the the plain storm and talk about this particular date, uh, which stands out a bit. Uh, but uh, here we go. So. Here's our storm in the east, and if you watch that uh, on the latest GFS uh, from uh, this evening, this is at uh, in seven minutes according to the GFS, uh, wrapped up thousand two low. the The low is not especially in, intense, but you know the height of the north is so right. strong. You got this, you know, very tight uh, pressure gradient here. What's that? That's a thirty one millibars, so roughly. From 40, let's say the bottom of the H is at 48, and the bottom of the L is at 38. So that's 600 miles. Right. That, that's a, a 30 millibar change in about 600 miles. That's a pretty tight pressure that's gradient. That's a pretty, pretty good pressure gradient. And, you know, sometimes, and this is now directed to all of you winter weather lovers who look for, uh, you know, big snowfall. 
uh, some of the larger scale snowstorms that we've had in, in recent or modern history has not been necessarily because the storm itself was so deep, but because of the high. Yes. The placement of the high. Really good overrunning. Yeah, yeah, that's that that's the thing that created the uh, the the tons of snow. I think one which one of those winters was it uh, uh, either o two two o three or o three. I think it might have been o three o four uh, was um, a winter where it, you you lows never got deeper than say a thousand eight or a thousand twelve, but yet all these massive overrunning. Right. Uh, setups. The, the 1983, the megalopolitan storm that jumped one to two feet from Washington to Boston, the low was, I, I won't say it was a piddling little thing, but it was it was like a an 04, 05 low, but it was bucking into a like a 1040 high yeah. over Maine, and the gradient was so tight, and the thing that threw everybody, the forecasters off, Joe, back then I think we were using still the, the old LFM. It was either the old LFM or the brand new NGM. NGM. maybe. And the problem was that the models were having such a difficult time in figuring out where the cutoff of yeah. the snow was going to be. Which is, and at one point, which Albany, still remains an ongoing problem. Right. But at one point, Albany and Boston actually took the, the snow warnings or the heavy... heavy took uh, them down. Thumb down. Took them down, thinking that... You know, everything was going to be shunted south by that tremendous high, but then that low had just enough oof to create that uh, tightening gradient and create a, a, a really localized right. heavy band of snow. Uh, tremendous. So, so here's our surface low backing west and doing that counterclockwise loop. This is where we get into the stronger winds. But like you point out, Joe, at least off the GFS, and I have... Um, I'm using the precip rate. I really want to switch to the radar because I think that's a better, that'll be better for us to use if it lets me. Uh, so this is uh, what the GFS sees as the radar. So uh, th there's that rain that comes in late uh, morning, early at, during the morning tomorrow, and, and, and sweeps back west. Look at that! Look at that! That and heavy it deepens it to a 99, by the way. Now you yes. look at that and you say to yourself, "Uh oh, you know, lower southeastern New York is going to get hammered," and then what happens? Boom. Exactly, ah. because of that mid-level dry air that's kind of you know exactly. that that's gonna, that that's setting up there. Going to run into it like a wall. And, and while that's moving westward, you've got this this uh, plains low, this Rockies low that's actually being forced to go further south because of the action in the east. Everything's there's this log jam. Uh, the low starts to move east, and then. That's moving east while that one's moving west. You don't really see that too often. Right, right. Uh, and, of course, you see all the snow that that's producing across Wyoming and through the Dakotas and then up into North Dakota uh, lifting up. And there might be a severe weather event here Thursday night into Friday morning uh, in uh, the middle and lower Missis the middle Mississippi Valley and back through the southern plains. Right, Chicago, uh, look at that. Right, and then that swings eastward. And here we are, Friday morning, you still have the low east of the Virginia coast, but it's dropping southward now, and the the, low, the system to the west still can't move east because that high it can't is... Move east. It's going to shear, shear off to the north. Right. Yeah. There we go. And, and then finally, goes. finally, when we get to sa uh, Saturday, the coastal low pulls out and weather conditions improve uh, going through Sunday and into the first part of next week, although I don't know, it does... Have something I here. I that. Yeah, I said, I said uh, that for Sunday weird. night and Monday. So I'm wondering what that is. Uh, haven't really been able to give it a close enough look. There's some kind of. Well, anyway, let's just roll on. Let Let's just roll this forward. I'm going to go bring up some more Maybe stuff about that plane storm. Something. I don't know. It could wrinkle. be. Well, there's another front that comes through later in the week. One of the things I'm noticing, Joe, is the fact that when we go in the long haul, and you know, we've got this typhoon, this this. Uh, um, Super Typhoon Hadjit. I've been pronouncing it differently every single time. Hajibis, uh, that is heading for Tokyo, may right. make a, may go right over Tokyo as a category through a category two um, hurricane. But one of the things that that's going to do in the longer term, I believe, if we watch it, and let me get to that. Got the northern hemisphere, or I got the whole northern. We can do the whole northern hemisphere. We just can't really see it very well. On this on this view, plus you're looking at it kind of sideways. Yeah, they're, they're, but there it is on the upper left. Okay, but what that does is a recurving typhoon going into Japan and moving out. It hooks up with this upper low uh, that's up in um, in Asia, uh, in the eastern part of uh, Asia. There, Kamchatka. By the way. Uh, okay, thank you. Kamp and energizes Siberia. that, and it winds up down the road, energizing uh, a, a low in the Gulf of Alaska, which in turn 
should mean tro a deep trough at some point or at a couple of different points in the east in the longer term. There's one that appears here uh, for the middle part of next week that swings through, and that's something uh, for maybe Thursday of next week. And then, more, look, more energy coming into the, into the west, uh, into the uh, Rockies and Plains. Is that another, and, uh, one? another Another trough. trough. And we showed yesterday, if you look at, you know, talking about how weather patterns rhyme, right. um, if you look at what we're going through now and what we went through with the Montana storm uh, from uh, uh, 10 days or so ago, and this next th this next system, it, they kind of look very similar in terms of the, the upper air setup. Brief appearance of a ridge in the east before another deep trough comes into the east later in the, uh, in, in the forecast periods. I think that makes sense, uh, this pattern, a lot of progression. Uh, and uh, each one of these troughs will probably bring a progressively colder shot of air right. going down. Kind so that's res resonance. Now, is it too early to start looking at Asia for, uh, or, or, or Siberian, Siberian snow, snow cover? Let's give it another six days, and we'll be halfway through the month. Okay. Because then I think it'll be something that's uh, that'll be worthwhile. All right. So let let let's take a look at the uh, the plain snowstorm. Before we do that, though, uh, on this date, Joe, back in 1979, October 10th. Do you remember? October 10th, 1979. 1979? That, or that snow. Uh, the oh, yes. yes! And I remember that because the Baltimore Orioles were playing in the, in the World Series. And, um, yeah, I remember I remember that very... Not, not that you, it rings a bell. That's right. Well, that was... And Dr. One Jerry Thaler, who's now retired. He must be in his late 80s now or whatever. Very well-known climatologist. He had uh, a few inches of snow out of that up in Yorktown Heights, 1979. Well, Scott Briller went into the P P Penn State University archive and pulled up the North American reanalysis of that day uh, in 1979. And this is what it looked like. The, the upper air 500, a nice... Uh, that for, for October 10th, that's a pretty deep trough in the east. You had a surface low that developed off the uh, southeast of uh, just east of the Delaware coast. There's your famous 540 thickness yep. coming right down from just from Boston to New York City to Washington, D.C. And uh, you can see the other different levels of the atmosphere at play. Uh, I, have, I have a memory of that being Columbus Day. Mm -hmm. It was one of those, you know, it was the holiday weekend. Right. I right. remember it being... Um, um, uh, I remember it being a Monday for some, but this says it's not. This this was proves me wrong because it says uh, this was valid Wednesday 18Z. So I, I guess mean, I guess it wasn't a Monday, but I know remember it being around Columbus Day. I remember walking through the Throgs Neck se section of the Bronx. Um, maybe I was coming home from school, and you know a lot of leaves were down. Everything leaves right. had already turned, and seeing these big white flakes. That came down didn't last very long, right. but I do have a distinct memory of that. Yeah, now that you, you know, again, I, I think, I, th I think that was uh, the the snow had reached all the way down to the Baltimore area. Yes, it did. Were, it and they did. were talking about the snow affecting the World Series in Baltimore of all places. Now, October the ninth, nineteen seventy two. I think it was the ninth, mm -hmm. the earliest sighting of snow in the New York metropolitan area. So just missed it by one day. So yeah, the, with this storm. This system was was the tenth. This was the tenth. So yeah, October the ninth. And if you want to talk about some some really really crazy weather? How about October fourth, nineteen eighty eight? I believe it was eighty eight. The uh, I mean that storm jumped like twenty inches of snow in the Berkshires, and yeah. the snow in portions of uh, the Lower Hudson Valley. And that you talk about an early snowfall. That was that was it. That was off the off the wall. Well, so, I was wondering. You know, it's a, I, I don't retain a lot of that data anymore in my brain, unfortunately. And um, I didn't realize this, but last year uh, in uh, the Northern Plains, I saved it. What, what did I do with it? It's in one of these graphics here. Is it There it is. This was last year on October 10th in eastern North Dakota to uh, western Minnesota. Uh, getting uh, this was their the storm totals that they got Grand Fork six to eight um, Valley City uh, twelve to eighteen uh, on the Minnesota side you had two to three three to four inches in in, in some places 
This was a year ago. So you know, I'm thinking, boy, to have two snowstorms back to back uh, this early is pretty unusual. Uh, maybe it's not that unusual. I, maybe should, I should pay a little more attention here. Well, that, what you've just done is maybe open up a can of worms because there may be a certain percentage of the people who are watching us right now saying, well, if it happened last year and it's happening again this year, that means that maybe this winter will be similar to last year. I said not- yesterday, and I will say this again, uh, as bears repeating, make no presumption, presumptions about what you're seeing now as a prelude in one way or the other with regards to the kind of winter we're going to have. And also, in thinking about it now, and back in the day when you and I were uh, getting started in this crazy uh, business of weather, they used to, they being NOAA, uh, the National Weather Service, they used to make the uh, upcoming winter prediction, I think right around or just after Thanksgiving, and now I think they do it in mid-October. I think it may very well be next week. That they will issue their yeah, their, winter, their winter prediction as to what it's going to be like. Oh, I could tell you what they're going to put out. It's going to be above normal, below, above normal temperatures, maybe near normal precip. But as far as temperatures are concerned, it's above normal. They never go out on a limb, do they? No, they don't. <laughs> uh, they'll give the usual standard uh, footnote that says uh, the the uh, one variable is the is, no. is the uh, North Atlantic Oscillation That's not the Greenland block. Variable. It's the disclaimer. It's the disclaimer. The annual disclaimer. <laughs> right. Uh, the annual disclaimer. So if, okay, if that shows up, then all bets are off. Blah blah blah. It's the they same do thing that so year. this way the Capital Weather Gang don't beat up on him. Right at the end of the at the end of the winter season. Right, uh, and then you'll have a winter like you had in thirteen, fourteen, fourteen, fifteen, where there was no uh, North Atlantic oscillation. It was all about the East Pacific oscillation being off the wall negative, and we wound up you know cold for much of both of those uh, yeah, but those two seasons. Really, you know, but it doesn't you know, matter. It doesn't matter because last year in our part of the country we had. An above normal winter because I think it was like 1.2 degrees above normal temperature wise. But that was based upon the fact that December and most of January was abnormally mild or right. warm. And then in we fact, had it was one of the warmest de- December's on record, 2.6 degrees above normal in this part of the world. And yet, and yet we had that blast of bitter frigid cold at the last week of January and on into a good part of February. And then we had a snow for God's sake uh, the first week of March. First weekend of March, that dumped a, like five, six, seven, inches right, down. and that immediately <clears throat> biased or colored every colored everybody's opinion about what the winter was like. So statistically, it turned out to be a milder than normal winter, but in the minds of a lot of people, it turned out to be cold and snowy. It depends on, you know, your location. Yes. Okay. So these are the, some of the forecast amounts I pulled them up from the local weather services out there. Uh, across. This is from uh, the Weather Service office in Rapid City, South Dakota, where they're going for 6 to 11 inches. So basically you're seeing areas of 6 to 12, 8 to 14, uh, and higher. And uh, just jumping around to some of the other offices here, this office is, uh, oh God, which, which one was this? This is the one uh, to the west. So I don't know if that's Casper is the office I pulled it from. Of course, it used to be easy when I knew what all the, the call letters were. Um, now it's R I W, whatever. I have no idea. Um, maybe this was Billings that I pulled it from. I don't think it was. But no, no, because this is Casper, Wyoming. So um, six to eight inches there. Lake Yellowstone, six to eight. Cody, uh, six to eight. So that's where the back edge of the heavy snow is in Wyoming. And that will jump east into. Uh, uh, toward North Dakota, 8 to 12 in Bismarck, 8 to 12 in Dickens, Dickinson, uh, and you can see it's a lar- fairly large swath. And this, by the way, I think this forecast is only through Thursday night because there's going to be some additional snow on top of that. And the Weather Service on their map, which I saved here somewhere, unless I got rid of it. Is this it? I think this is it. So that's their total snowfall that goes right to... Uh, Saturday 8 a.m. They're talking some 20. This is off the weather service forecast. Right, so right. you've got 20 to 20, almost 30 inches being forecast for parts of North Dakota here. This is some snowstorm even in the depth of uh, you know uh, the the uh, the middle of winter. Which often in the middle of winter, usually up here, they don't get a lot of snow because the the jet stream is too far south. They're usually too deep into the cold or cold air. But this is this is very impressive for this time of year, and I guess it rivals. Uh, at, at the very least, it rivals what happened pretty much on the same date last year. Right. Hard Crazy stuff. One year later. 
Yep, on the same day. So usually it doesn't work out that way. Usually, a big snowstorm, you figure like uh, you know the following year, it turns out to be diametrically opposite, like you know, unusually mild. And then people walk around and say, "Hey, remember last year at this time we had snow? Guess what? People are walking around now saying, "Hey, guess what? We had snow this time last year too." <laughs> uh, almost, you know, pretty soon it's going to be our turn. Don't I, say that. I know. I have to. I have to say those things, mm -hmm. Joe. Oh look, lake effect on the 384 hour. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to do that. No. So just just a review here uh, with a close up view of the system in the east, and you'll see also that system in the plains. So again, for you get you get this thing offshore uh, moving in a counterclockwise fashion. Uh, there will be gales tomorrow during uh, off the New, along the immediate New Jersey coast and over Long Island and southeastern New England in particular. Uh, I don't think the winds are going to be a huge problem inland. There might be some gusts into the mid and high 20s at times, no. but that would be it. Yeah. It's all about the coast, really, I'm even with the rain. I'm surrounded on three sides of my house by 50 to 75-foot trees, mostly uh, maple, oak trees, ash. Uh, and, and if I wake up in the morning and look out the window, if I'm not seeing them wavering back and forth, you know, it's, it's, it's no big deal. And I don't think there's going to be a big deal for at least where I am. Coastal areas, Sound Shore region of Lower Hudson Valley, Southern Westchester, and of course Long Island and the Jersey Coast. That's where you're going to find those uh, 30 and 40 plus mile per hour All right, so wind it's, gusts. We have a nice crowd tonight, by the way. We have 72 folks on. Um, and and uh, thanks to uh, the chairman, Scott Briller, for that uh, that uh, Penn State University uh, graphic that he, uh, he, he uh, sent to me. So we were able to look at that October uh, 1979 um, event. Yeah. Uh, let's see. PG&E in California, says William Uber, if they don't re recon their power lines and turn power back on and have lines down or crossing each other, guess what? You put the fault on a line that starts a fire. I guess, yeah, I mean, I, I guess. I, you know, I, know, I, I don't... I really don't know a whole lot of the about the history other than the headlines. I really don't know a whole lot about the history of that that wildfire. Um, I believe, as I remember, that they did rule that the the, the, the court system ruled that uh, you know that it was started by a, a power line that went down in the spark and that that triggered off uh, a massive um, uh, power uh, fire. I mean, it also brought into question afterward uh, the. Um, you know, a lot of homes being built in areas that are that where wildfires were always common, and, right. and whether right. we should be doing that. So you know, brings up a lot of conversation. I'm not taking a position in this. I'm just kind of stating what happened uh, at the time. Um, let's go back. We have uh, oh, Robert Sabatino hasn't been on for a while. He's too busy in Florida, taking in the sun all the time, and then waiting for the cold. Uh, Mar Marico, Mauricio. I uh, hope I got it right. Brown, Mauricio, Marico Brown. We had a blizzard in '96 in Marietta, Georgia, and we got about a foot and a half of, of snow. Uh, and the mountains got about three feet. Well, um, I will probably be down in that in, in, in that area at some point over the next couple of months. So I uh, I'm kind of hoping that uh, maybe while I'm down there, I'll see what happens. When it snows in Georgia, you don't want to drive though. When it snows, in no, Georgia. no, I'll have somebody else. I'll just, I'll just, no, I won't even drive. I'll just, it'll be a sporting event for they me. I'll just sit and worst, watch. Was in the Atlanta area about, you know, four years ago. They had a storm that uh, was misinterpreted by yes. the uh, most people. I think there was a watch, and then they changed it to an advisory. But the people interpreted an advisory being lower than a watch. Right, and uh, and then they, and just, they went out on the roadways, and you know all kinds of mayhem. Well, they don't. Some they people don't. waited like eight hours on the on the road trying to get back home. You know what I don't understand? It's that uh, with with respect to that, I'm not. First of all, a lot of people that that have moved to Georgia, excuse me, North Carolina, South Carolina, are people from up here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they they should be familiar with how to drive and stuff. So I guess it's frustrating for them. But um, occasional snowfalls of a few inches are not that uncommon. Right. So uh, why is it as if every year, as if it's never happened before? And then I think back to the 
the superstorm of 93, which produced, I think, almost uh, two feet in, in the Atlanta area. Right. Or in areas surrounding Atlanta, certainly. And I think even in downtown Atlanta, they had at least a foot or a foot and a half. So, yeah, it doesn't happen every year or every two years or every five years, but it does happen sometimes. Right. So there should be some, you know, some recollection of, yeah, we should be able to handle this. It's like that explanation in the uh, movie Airport. Remember when Dean Martin starts screaming at Burt Lancaster, "Why weren't you guys prepared?" And you, you say, "You, how come the guys over in how how come in Minnesota or in the, the Dakotas are able to clear away the snow like this?" And you know, Burt Lancaster said to Dean Martin, "says Well, they get about three times more snow than we do, yeah. so they they're used to this." You know, it's well. That kind uh, of so here's so, so usually we get the sun angle question. Uh, in the in in uh, in January when you know that it starts coming up, uh, but we actually have one here from Nick Cortez who says the sun angle is you you the sun angle guy is the sun angle weak this time of year or is it still relatively strong? The sun angle now is uh, well let's see it was uh, seven today is the ninth sixteen of two weeks so we, right now the sun angle is about the equivalent of where the sun would be in the opening days of March. In another week or so, we're going to be talking about a sun angle that's about as high as late February. Right. So that sun angle is going down really, really quickly. Fairly now. quickly. Yeah. Uh, Savage Stuff 20 says that super typhoon probably will change the pattern again in the U.S. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, I, I, I think it'll, it'll uh, energize a trough in the east, and then maybe there'll be a bit of a, a, a sh very short break in transition, and then maybe another trough in the east uh, to follow. Now, again, don't make any long-term assumptions about this. Um, Scott Donegan, I've been out of touch a bit, but uh, will there be a Joe and Joe show after November 15th? Maybe dual Skype sessions when big events lurk. That's well, Mr. Mr. Scott, Joe, Joe and I have had, we've been having conversations about this. Uh, we are in deep negotiation. Um, I'm the one of the two of us. Joe's got the much better memory than I do. Uh, but I'm more tech savvy, so I'm trying. I have to get him to kind of get a slightly more tech savvy, so that he and I will be able to do the Joe and Joe show from our perspective locations. Right. We're going to try. Okay. Right. Uh, no guarantees from the um, from the uh, from the management. Um, just uh, ooh, Chuck Cardillo was on. You had no rain up today, there, Chuck, in the Catskills. He had an inch and a half, I think, yesterday. Had no rain today. Or the day before, I forget. He did say he had an inch and a half either yesterday or the day before. Uh, Mac Attack, uh, welcome by the way. Uh, welcome uh, to to uh, my uh, Patreon, um, uh, my Patreon platform. Appreciate it. Uh, the perfect storm of '91 says David Schwartz was a hurricane upon post storm analysis, mm -hmm. according to uh, Sir Wikipedia. Surely the greatest sc scholar of our age, he says. <laughs> Um, just running back, we've got a, just a little bit of time left before you and I have to go back to uh, doing something. Uh, Mark uh, Mark G says that the, I'm, I'm, he's along the New York State border in West Central Connecticut, and the rain looks at, like it made its way into parts of the Hudson Valley today, which right. you can testify to. Right. Uh, is there any chance, ask Savage Stuff, uh, that the low moves 20 to 50 miles further west than the model before pulling away? Oh, we have one of those... Yeah, no. you know, like like it, <laughs> I don't think it materially changes what's going to happen because uh, now you're talking about. So look, if you if if the low goes half a degree further to the west, then the western edge of the rain will go about half a degree further to the west, and the and the wind might be a little stronger, slightly further inland. But you're really just like not happening. Yeah. Now, if it was a snowstorm, we would be tearing this the, the models apart to try to figure out if we right. could get those 25 exactly. to 50 miles. Exactly. Of course, I'm sitting in a good spot in this particular situation, so I would I couldn't care one way or the other. Mm. Isn't that uh, isn't that good? Uh, and he also Mark G got 45 hundreds today. The donut hell hole is filling in. Mm. A lot of spots are dry, but I, I one of the things I did like about today is the fact that uh, we had um, uh, the the rain over Long Island soaked in quite nicely. Uh, William Uber, Joe and Joe on on Long between between the North Fork and the South Fork on uh, northeast to east wind funnels the water downtown. Oh well, that's right. So if you get that uh, that 
that east northeast wind that comes in between the two forks Between and then the gets forks. down into um, into Riverhead there. Yeah. All right, so want to wrap it up? I guess so. Any parting thoughts, commentary? No. Things to say? Not much to say. Predictions? Um, we'll do Siberian snow cover a week from today. How does that work for you? Well, I'm looking forward to that. All right, I'm good. sure a lot of people out there are looking forward to it. And by this time next week, who knows? I'd, again, next week, sometime, maybe toward the latter part of next week, the uh, Climate Prediction Center will come out with their uh, usual guess as to what's going to happen for the upcoming winter um, season. So we'll All right, we'll see what they say. All right, Scott Brewer and uh, Nick Cortese uh, contributing to the uh, tip jar tonight. Thank you very much for hitting Super Chat. Really appreciate it greatly. Uh, we are going to have um, our uh, morning weather in five so be sure to tune in for that by the way if you haven't done so and i you know joe joe rayo has done this by the way he and i have done it he's even he has done it even he has the notifications turned on so that when uh, you know he get when i put out my forecast at some ungodly hour in the morning when you're still asleep uh he gets the notification and mrs rayo comes running in and says he's at it yep yeah. Uh, so uh, if you haven't downloaded my free weather app, uh, do so. Because it's been updated, by the way, so you don't have to put in your location anymore. But all, it will automatically default to your location. Uh, so be sure to, do, to uh, download the updates at the App Store for the iPhone and also for, uh, on, on Google Play. And also my, um, my other app, uh, well, it's actually um, Ben Scott's app, uh, the Angry Weatherman. That app is out and available for uh, for uh, Android devices. So go to Google Play and download that also for free. And I put the link up on the uh, on the chat board. Uh, one last thing for those of you who are interested in a in a weather experience so great, so grand that you'll just you know I don't know. What would be so great? And you'll just be beyond belief. Um, make sure that you uh, take a look at and join my weather platform that I have on Patreon. It's a 24-7 type of platform. We do a lot of stuff exclusively for Patreon members, including uh, exclusive uh, videos. Uh, you can message me at any time for um, a timely response back. Uh, and if you need help with day-to-day uh, -day stuff with, with weather, there's some higher tiers available uh, for those of you who need extra hand-holding. And it starts at 2 bucks a month, and there's the link for, uh, for Patreon. So Weather in 5 tomorrow morning, regular live stream uh, tomorrow night. Uh, Time-wise, it's, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure yet, but I will let you know. Okay, so I said my goodbyes. Bye. Bye. Have a great night, everybody.